Thanks, uh, Gary. And um, thank you too, to everyone, just for praying for us. I mean, Gary thanked our wives, and we certainly want to thank them, but thank you for praying for us. It was, we not only appreciated your prayers for just a neat time spiritually, but uh, we did a lot of traveling while we were there, obviously a lot of flying, but a lot of driving. And even the first day we arrived in LA, it took us so long to get through the airport, and then we had a couple of things to do, but we were driving up to Jack and Michelle's, which is like another three or four hour drive from the airport. And, you know, daylight savings over there, so it gets dark at 6 o'clock, and it was pouring with rain. And it was really dark, and it's like a three-way highway all the way to the, to the um, Jack and Michelle's place. On the right-hand side, because everything's back to front, remember, on the right-hand lane is all the slow trucks. On the left-hand lane is all these vehicles flying past you, and we were kind of in the middle. And sometimes it was really hard to see, even where we were going in some of the lanes because of the darkness. Uh, if you know that song, we were singing it, Jesus Take the Wheel, you know, that one, <laughs> as you're going down the highway. But uh, anyway, we were grateful for, for getting there and back safely. And uh, I want to say thank you too to James and um, Dave Odomisi, who filled the pulpit for, uh, for the last few weeks. Dean was saying to me this morning, I need to get reacquainted with this thing. I haven't seen it for a little while, but it's good to be back here. And so I invite you now to take your Bibles and open them up to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, we're still making our way through the Sermon on the Mount, and this morning we're just going to look at a couple of verses, it's chapter 7 and uh, verses 13 and 14, and I want to read those verses up front here just so we're familiar with them, and I'm sure you know them well. Verse 13 says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And it's interesting because last Sunday, Sam and I were at Faith Bible Church in California, where their pastor is Chris Mueller, who many of you know, and we had a couple of their elders preaching here recently, Sean Farrell and Nigel Shaler are part of that church as well. And it just so happened that Chris Mueller was preaching these two verses and it was uh, just an encouragement to hear them, but also a, a real challenge. But these two verses, in many ways, I would say, have had a long history in my life. In fact, I need to kind of wind back the clock many, many years, back to the late 80s. I was uh, in my early 20s, uh, it was before I was married. But every night in those days, I used to listen to a sermon falling asleep, or listen to it until I fell asleep. And they were primarily sermons that were preached by John MacArthur, and as many of you know, John MacArthur is the, the pastor or the church that put on the Shepherds Conference that we went to, and so it was kind of amazing to having heard him many, many years ago, to hear him still preaching. He's, he's been preaching in that church for 55 years, and uh, he's still going strong. Well, he's going reasonably strong anyway. He's obviously getting elderly now. He's in his, in his, um, in his mid-80s. But when I was in my early 20s, I not only listened to sermons while I was um, falling asleep, but sometimes when I was at work, I would listen to them as well. And, and I used to work for Telecom in Palmerston North. If you're familiar with the city of Palmerston North, it's the biggest, ugliest building in the middle of town there where I used to work. And I often would do shift work and do it alone. And so I was able to work and listen to sermons. And I can remember one particular night, the sermon that was playing had a huge impact in my life. And it's very vivid even in my mind today. It sort of seems like yesterday, not 30 years ago when I heard it. But it was MacArthur preaching this passage, Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. And it was really convicting. And it really forced me to evaluate my life and ask some serious questions of where I was at. I mean, I was going to church, but the question was, was I a Christian? I was doing a bunch of religious stuff, but the question was, am I saved? I knew a lot about Jesus, but the question really was, did Jesus know me? I professed to know Christ with my mouth, but did I possess Christ was the issue. And these questions were circulating in my mind, and I can still remember being under conviction as I was listening to that sermon. You know, sometimes your heart pounds when that kind of thing happens, and I honestly had to evaluate my life that particular night. Because these are challenging verses. They're confronting verses. Look at them again. Like Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. The gate's wide, the way's easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. 
I mean, these two verses begin the conclusion of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. We began looking at the sermon, and it begins way back in chapter 5 of Matthew in verse 1. And this really is a sermon like no other sermon. And we know that, don't we? Because we've seen that. And we know that the preacher is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the second person of the Trinity. He's the Son of God, and he's preaching this sermon to us. And every good sermon should force the hearers to respond in some way. Whether that response be greater obedience or maybe more passionate worship or maybe repentance or maybe more faithful service, sermons should force us to make decisions and to have responses. Sermons are not meant to be just information dumps. Sermons are designed to bring change. And so a good preacher should bring his listeners to the point where they are forced to make a conscious choice, either go God's way or go man's way. And so in this final section of the sermon, Jesus forces us to make a choice. And there really are only two options. The, question, the options are, am I going to follow Jesus on his particular terms, or am I going to go my own way and do my own thing? And Jesus makes it very clear in these final verses of the Sermon on the Mount that there are not multiple choices when it comes to our eternal destiny. There isn't the happy way that we could choose or the wealthy way or the sporty way or the relaxing way or the holiday way. There are really only two choices, two ways that we can head in life, either life or death, either blessing or curse, either heaven or or hell. And if you remember the scene of the Sermon on the Mount here, remember Jesus is preaching. He's, he's overlooking the Sea of Galilee on a hill there, and he's preaching to a, a mixed crowd, and there's different types of people in the, in the crowd, maybe two particular types of people, and maybe there's like a hundreds, maybe thousands of people who are sitting there listening to him preach this sermon. And on the one hand, he has his true followers. There are those who are his true disciples, those who have recognized that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the one who has been sent by God. So Jesus has true followers, true disciples listening to him. And maybe there's a few curious onlookers in the crowd on that particular occasion as well, but there's also the religious people. There's those Pharisees, those Sadducees, those scribes. And these religious ones, they're, remember, concerned only about really their external activity. They wanted to look spiritual on the outside. Yes, these people believed there was a God. They even loved their Bible, which was the Old Testament in those days. And they wanted to obey the law, the Old Testament law. But remember, as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, for the most part, they've misinterpreted it. And their motivations of these religious people are primarily selfish, and they thought that they had already entered into God's kingdom by doing good works and by obeying the law, but they were deceived. And so with his audience in mind, Jesus brings them to a fork in the road, and he exhorts them to make a decision. And likewise, in these two verses, Jesus brings us to the point where we too need to make a decision. We need to make a choice. You can't just sit on the fence. You need to make a decision. And we know, don't we, that life is full of choices. Some choices are pretty simple. simple. They're kind of minor, right? What will I eat today? What will I wear today? Other choices might be a little bit more major. What job shall I have? What house should I buy? What spouse should I should I look for? But then there are some critical choices that we need to make in life. For example, what will you do with Jesus? And what will you do with his teaching? That's the decision that we need to make today. And so we've got some critical decisions to make. And Jesus here presents to his audience what we could say two gates, two ways or two roads to travel on, two destinations, two groups, and we're going to look at them this morning. It's kind of like a simple outline. It's much the same outline that MacArthur used in that original sermon that I listened to. But first of all, we see here that there are two gates that lead to two roads. And you must decide which gate to go through. So what does Jesus say about this narrow gate? Look at verse 13 at the beginning there. Jesus simply says, enter it. Enter by the narrow gate. This is a command. 
It's an imperative that Jesus gives us. There's a decision to be made here, and Jesus even tells us the best decision to make. Choose the narrow gate. Enter through it. Don't just sit there and admire the gate. Don't just look at it or dream about it or take a photo of it or draw it or anything like that. Don't just listen to preaching about this gate. Jesus says you must literally enter through it. Go through it. And you might ask, well, what is it? What is this narrow gate? Well, the narrow gate represents all of Jesus' teaching. It's embracing all that he has been preaching in this particular sermon. And so if you want to enter through the narrow gate, you must be characterized by the Beatitudes that Jesus preached on right at the beginning of this sermon. And only those who have been, you could say, clothed in the righteousness of Christ can enter through this narrow gate. And remember that righteousness of Christ is greater than the righteousness that the Pharisees supposedly had. But unfortunately, many people over the years have just admired the teachings of Jesus. They've listened to the principles that he's taught, but they've never fully accepted him as their personal Lord and Savior. Many people have called Jesus a great man. Many people see Jesus as a, as a special prophet or maybe a wonderful example, but that is as far as it goes for them, but that's not far enough. We must follow him wholeheartedly. We must enter through the narrow gate. I mean, you can admire Jesus and you can admire Christianity, but that leads to disaster. That literally is a one-way ticket to hell. You can dream about heaven, but that doesn't get you there. That only leads to destruction. And that's certainly not the outcome we want, and it's not what Jesus wanted. That's why he says here, enter by the narrow gate. It's a command for all of us. And it demands an action from us. And maybe you might be asking the question, well, if I, if I go through this narrow gate, what is it that I'm entering into? What is on the other side of it? Well, the narrow gate takes you to the kingdom of heaven. I mentioned that verse, chapter 5, verse 20 just before that says this, For I tell you, Jesus says in the sermon, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, You'll never enter, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven. You need Christ's righteousness to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus is going to say in a few verses' time at the end of chapter 7, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And so... When you go through the narrow gate, you're heading towards the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. You can kind of imagine, if you like, and MacArthur uses this illustration, you can imagine a sign above the narrow gate that says, this way to the kingdom of heaven. Or maybe the sign could say, this way to heaven. And we know that those in the kingdom of heaven possess eternal life. And so the ultimate destination for those who enter the, this narrow gate is heaven. And you might even ask the question, well, how do I enter this gate? How do I get through it? Well, as I said before, we need to go all the way back to begin with the Beatitudes to find out how somebody enters into the kingdom of heaven. Remember all the way back there, the, the Beatitudes taught us that we need to be poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, we need to be characterized by humility and realize our own spiritual bankruptcy, that we don't have any righteousness in and of ourselves. We can't contribute anything to our salvation whatsoever. We have to come to Jesus with absolutely nothing, fully depending on him. And remember those Beatitudes taught us that, that it is blessed to mourn, and the mourning there is mourning over our sin and over our sinfulness. We need to hate it. That's the attitude we need to get have to get through the narrow gate. We need to be meek. Remember all of those things. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's what it means to be able to enter through the narrow gate. And if you come with those attitudes, you'll be able to enter into the kingdom. Let me flesh it out a little bit more for you, because there are, you could say, certain other conditions that we must follow if we want to enter through this narrow gate. Maybe the question is, why is it portrayed even as narrow? And the answer to that is because there's only one way to get through it. 
Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, you know this well, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through who? Jesus. Through me, he says. There's only one way to get through the gate into heaven, and it's through Jesus. Jesus even said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved, in John 10, verse 9. And the, ga and the gate is narrow because there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved, Acts 4, verse 12. And there is one God and one mediator also between God and men. Who is that? It is the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. Jesus is the only way. You know, there's an old saying that says, all roads lead to Rome. And that's true geographically, but spiritually, all roads do not lead to heaven. There is only one road. It's a narrow road. There is no other. And so the way to enter that narrow gate and to get on the narrow way is to follow Jesus alone. That means that you can't put Jesus on the same level as all of the other great world leaders or the best inventors or maybe even the wisest minds because Jesus is the king over all the kings. He's the Lord over all lords. He's the creator of all. He is all wise and Jesus has no equal. And so it is a narrow gate because there is only one way of salvation. There is only one Savior. There is only one Jesus. There is only one true gospel, and that is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are not multiple ways to heaven, only one way. And so Jesus, in making this statement here in verse 13 about entering the narrow gate, is implicitly saying that the Mormon gospel is false because they miss the narrow gate. Their, their view of Jesus is wrong. The Jehovah's Witness gospel is wrong. It's false because they go knocking on doors hoping that their human achievement is going to get them into heaven. The Muslim gospel is wrong. Muhammad is not the savior. Jesus is the only savior. The spiritualist philosophy is wrong. The Roman Catholic doctrine of faith plus works is wrong. You can't get to heaven by good works or human achievements because there's no room for your works to fit through the narrow gate you'll get stuck. There's only one way, and that is Christ alone. And so we must also enter this gate alone, as it were. The person who comes through that gate can only come through by themselves. It was, I think, Martin Lloyd-Jones who used the, the illustration. He compared the narrow gate to like a, a, one of those turnstiles, that kind of turnstile that you might walk through when you go to a sporting venue or maybe even when you go to the supermarket, that kind of thing, where only one person can go through it alone. You have to go by yourself. You can't go through it with a whole crowd at the same time. Well, entering the kingdom of heaven is just like that. It's a personal decision. It's between you alone and God alone. And of course, this was such a, a foreign concept to the religious Jews of Jesus' day. They thought that they were already in God's kingdom because they were descendants of Abraham. And sadly, that's how some people even think today. Your ancestry does not save you. Having Christian parents does not save you. Regular church attendance does not save you. Being busy doing a whole bunch of church activities does not save you. Let me remind you, you are not born a Christian you don't automatically get a ticket to heaven if you have a Christian upbringing. And so the narrow gate demands that you come to God by yourself. Not as a family, not in a group. It's only wide enough for one at a time. And it can be hard, can't it? Because most of life we spend getting around in groups with family, with friends, with workmates, etc. But Jesus says you must come alone if you want to come through the narrow gate. And not only that, we must enter through this narrow gate with no strings attached or no baggage included. Entering by this narrow gate means you just can't take anything else with you. You can't take anyone with you. You can't take stuff with you. You must leave your suitcases and your briefcases behind. The suitcase of sin, the suitcase of self-righteousness must be thrown away. This is the idea of recognizing your spiritual bankruptcy. You have nothing to bring, nothing to contribute to your salvation 
Jesus said, remember this, if anyone wishes to come to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I think Dave preached on this last Sunday. For whoever wishes to save his life shall shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. You remember the story of the rich young ruler. He wanted to enter into God's kingdom. He wanted to walk through the narrow gates, but what did Jesus say to him? He told him to go and sell everything that he had and give it to the poor, but the rich man didn't want to do it because he was so rich, and so he didn't do it, and he went away sad. He wanted to go through the narrow gate and take his briefcase of money with him, but he can't because you can't fit both. He wanted to go on his terms instead of God's terms, and so he ended up walking through the wide gate, which he and his briefcase could easily fit in. So to enter the narrow gate, we must come alone. We must come empty-handed. We must come totally stripped of everything. We must come to God totally depending on him, just as a little child totally depends on his or her parents for everything they have. If you haven't come to God with this attitude, then you haven't gone through the narrow gate. You're still on the wrong road. Also, we will enter this great gate with this narrow gate with great difficulty. It's difficult to go through the narrow gate. Why do I say that? How do I know that? Well, verse 14 tells us that only a few find it. You have to be looking for it in a sense to find it. You don't accidentally trip and fall into heaven. You don't slide through this gate accidentally. In another parallel passage in Luke 13, verses 22 to 24, it says that Jesus went through the towns and the villages. He was teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Somebody asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And Jesus said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Wow, that's a pretty heavy statement. It will be difficult for many people to become Christians. They might believe that God exists. They might even believe that Jesus died and rose again. But they will be unwilling to surrender their whole lives to Jesus. They'll fail to enter through the narrow gate. So it is hard to become a Christian. The Bible says you have to count the cost. There's a lot of people in this world who would love to go to heaven, but they're going to miss out because they're unwilling to follow God's standards for entering. I think the devil would try and make us believe that it's real easy to become a Christian. He would want us to think that all you have to do is just say like a little prayer and that's enough. Or just acknowledge that there is a God. Or just say thank you to Jesus for dying on the cross and you're in. That's what the devil would want, just something simple. But there's actually far more to salvation than that. There must be new attitudes. There must be new thinking. There must be a counting of the cost. There must be a true love for God and for others. There must be genuine repentance and turning from sin. There must be a transformed heart that leads to a transformed life. Sadly, in our day, the gospel's been watered down lots of times. It's been contaminated, you could say, by the the easy believism movement, or perhaps even the seeker-sensitive crowd, or shallow TV evangelists who offer cheap grace and not the true gospel. Remember what Jesus said in those verses. It's a scary thought. Many will try to enter, but will not be able to. So it's difficult to get through the narrow gate. And as we go through the narrow gate, we must also enter it with a repentant attitude. If you want to go through that narrow gate, you've got to be repentant. You've got to have a repentant heart. In other words, you've got to be willing to turn from your sins completely. This, of course, was one of the problems with the Pharisees because they thought that they were obeying God's law to the letter, and they didn't think they'd done anything wrong, but they were deceived. They needed to repent and turn from their sin of self-righteousness in order to get into the kingdom of heaven. Sure, they looked good on the outside. They looked religious, as it were, but inside they were terrible. And the Pharisees are just really an, an illustration of many people today. They try to look good on the outside, but really they're far from God on the inside. 
Remember what Jesus had to say about the Pharisees? He had some pretty choice words for them. <laughs> Called them snakes, whitewashed tombs, fools, hypocrites, blind men, lawless. I mean, pretty tough descriptions. But that was because they weren't transformed on the inside. They hadn't repented of their sin. Charles Spurgeon once said this, You and your sins must separate, or you and your God will never come together. It's true. You must come through the narrow gate with a repentant heart. You must confess your sin and turn from it. And so Jesus commands us here, enter by the narrow gate. But we must do it through Jesus Christ and him alone because he is the only savior. He's the only redeemer. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sin. We must enter that gate alone. We must take that personal step with no strings attached, no baggage, We'll do it with difficulty. It's not going to be easy. We need to do it with a repentant heart. That's how we get into the narrow gate. But Jesus also talks here about another gate. It's called the wide gate. Those who don't enter by the narrow gate will have no other choice, but they will be entering through the wide gate. It's either one or the other. And this gate is so wide that it can fit anyone and fit anything through it. I kind of picture this wide gate as having like a, an automatic door, as it were. And it's probably wide open 24-7, waiting for anyone and everyone who wants to walk through this gate. It's easy to walk through this gate. There's no rules. There's no boundaries. It's, it'll take anybody. It'll take all the man-made religions that there are. It'll take all the New Age philosophers and the atheists and the agnostics and the be kind to one another club. It'll take anybody. There's plenty of room for all the self-righteous people who walk through the wide gate, just like those Pharisees. It'll take the rich man and his briefcase full of money. It'll take the churchgoer who hasn't come to God on his terms. It'll take people with all their baggage of sin and selfishness. It'll take anybody who's just trying to work hard to please God to get into heaven. It'll take all the religious people who, come, who want to come to God, but not through Jesus. The wide gate is so wide that it'll take any doctrine, it'll take any false doctrine, it'll take the easy believism crowd, it'll, take, it'll be the gate for the false gospel preachers, it'll be the health, wealth, prosperity gospel gate. Later on in this chapter, we see in verse 22 where those people cry out to Jesus, Lord, Lord, it takes the self-deceived. These ones have all gone through the wide gate, they're spiritually deluded. This wide gate is for the person who says, I prayed a prayer when I was five years old, but hasn't produced a single fruit of repentance in the rest of their life. The person who acts like a Christian on weekends, but lives like a pagan on Monday to Friday, that's the gate they'll be going through. The wide gate takes all kinds of people. You can waltz on through this gate without a care in the world. The wide gate looks good. It's easy to step right through it. In fact, you don't even have to open it. As I said, it's automatic. It's opened ready for you. And this wide gate leads to the broad way, or as some translations say, the easy way. Probably the red carpet's rolled out to make it look attractive. There's probably nice music playing as you walk through this gate. And you know what? Most people are entering through this gate. Do you know why? Because there's a sign written above this wide gate. And I love how MacArthur explains this. Guess what that sign says? And here comes the kicker. The sign above the wide gate says, this way to heaven. It says, this way to the kingdom of heaven. It's the same sign above the narrow gate. It's above the wide gate as well. I mean, do you think the devil is gonna advertise the fact that the wide gate's going to hell? And destruction? I don't think so. He's too cunning for that, isn't he? He's a deceiver. And so there's a lot of people who think they're on the way to heaven, when in reality they're on their way to eternal destruction. They think everything's A-OK -okay because the sign says so. And it feels right, and everything looks good, and there's lots of laughter, and there's lots of fun, and they feel good, and their religion tells them everything's good, and their friends tell them that everything's OK. Life is full of fun and games. But there's a major problem. They haven't come to God on his terms. There's no repentance. There's no holiness. There's no Christian character. And by the way, I, th I think we get the impression when Jesus talks about these two gates and the two ways that 
He's referring to the straight and narrow road that goes straight to heaven, and it has true Christians on it, which we agree with that. But then when he talks about the wide road, we imagine a road going straight to hell. We imagine that the sign says this way to hell, and all the super sinful pagans, those who have committed murders and bank robberies and rapes and other horrific sins and terrible crimes, we we envisage them being on that gate, that wide road. Well, I think that's a misunderstanding of what Jesus is trying to say here. These two verses in 13 and 14 are not a contrast between true Christians and all non-believers. This is a contrast between true believers and religious people who think they are followers of Jesus, but aren't. If we wanted to, in some ways, complete the imagery or the illustration, you could think of it like this, that there's kind of a third road that Jesus doesn't even mention here that does lead to hell, and maybe that one is advertised for all atheists and those who hate God and those who are rebellious sinners who have no shame in admitting it, those people who shake their fist in the face of God, all the blasphemers, all the defiant people, those who hate God, those who ignore God, they're going to hell, we understand that, but that's not the illustration that Jesus is using here. In these verses, Jesus is comparing true Christians who are already on the narrow way with those religious people who think they are on the right road, but they aren't. And so the question for us is, which road are you on? Which road are you on? MacArthur describes the broad way like this. He says, the way that is broad is the easy, attractive, permissive, and self-oriented way of the world. There are few rules, few restrictions, and few requirements. All you need to do is profess Christ, say it, just verbally say it, or at least be religious, and you are readily accepted in that large and diverse group. Sin is tolerated, truth is moderated, and humility is ignored. God's word is praised, but not studied, and his standards are admitted, but not followed. This way requires no spiritual maturity, no moral character, no commitment, no sacrifice. It's the easy way of floating downstream. He says it's the tragic way which seems right to a man, but whose end is the way of death. That's the broad way. And as you sit here this morning, I need to ask you and ask myself, which road are you on? Which gate have you entered through, the narrow gate or the wide gate? Remember, the narrow gate's a hard way. It's the demanding way. It's the way of self-denial. Kind of reminds me of the sheep trails that you see that wind up through the hillsides. It's narrow. It's difficult. There's no room to fool around on this trail. There's no room to go astray. The pathway's narrow. There's no room for error. Friends, the kingdom of heaven is for those who take this narrow way. And it's a hard road to get on. Jesus also said this in Luke 14, 26. He said, if anyone comes to me, in other words, if anyone goes through the narrow gate and onto the narrow way and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Jesus makes a standard pretty tough. Only those who have placed Jesus Christ or submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in their, in their lives, will be on the narrow way. Now, obviously, in those verses, Jesus doesn't mean that we literally hate our family. What he's saying is there needs to be a contrast where we need to love him more than everyone else, including our family. Is he more important to us than our families and, ev- and everything else? And when Jesus said in those verses, take up your cross and follow him, What did he mean by that? Well, the question you need to ask is, what happened to everybody who hung on a cross? (laughs) They died. They all died. They lost their life. So when Jesus says, take up your cross, he means that we are to take up our whole lives and be willing to die for him. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's a tough standard, but that's the narrow way. Christianity is not the easy way. (laughs) It's the hard way. So Jesus has talked about two gates and... The narrow, the wide, two ways, narrow, broad, or you could say wide. And by the way, in order to get on the wide road, 
In reality, you just have to do nothing. <laughs> That's the default position for everybody. Really, if we're all on the wide road and we need to get onto the narrow one. But these two roads, they lead to two destinations. The two roads lead to two destinations. We see that here in verses 13 and 14. Look again. It says that the broad way leads to destruction. And the narrow way leads to life. And remember I said that both ways or both gates have a signpost above them that says the same thing, this way to heaven. But we know that both don't arrive in heaven. Both ways point to the good life, to salvation, to God, to the kingdom, and to blessing, but only the narrow way gets there. The broad way, according to Jesus, leads to destruction, and destruction here doesn't refer to like extinction or annihilationism here, but to total ruin and to loss. It's not the complete loss of being, but it's the complete loss of well-being. It's the destination of every religion except for those who embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Bible calls this place of destruction hell. It is a place of everlasting torment, a place of suffering and anguish. It's a horrific place. It's where God's judgment is going to be poured out on those who have rejected his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hell is a real place. It is a terrible place. But Jesus says we can avoid it. If we enter through the narrow gate, the way that is narrow leads to eternal life, Jesus says, to everlasting heavenly fellowship with God, with his angels and with his people. And Jesus spoke of this place, didn't he, with his disciples. Remember back in John 14, Jesus said, in my father's house are many rooms, talking about heaven. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And so the narrow gate leads to the narrow way, way, which leads to the greatest life. It leads to eternal life. But the wide gate leads to the broad way, which leads to destruction. And then Jesus says in these verses, heading in these two, in these two directions, we see that there are two different groups of people. And we see here the two roads are occupied by two groups. The wide road, Many. The narrow road, few. The many are those who have rejected Jesus Christ's teaching and failed to come to him on his terms. They didn't listen to his sermon. They didn't heed his words. On the day of judgment, the many will be claiming to be followers of Christ. As I mentioned down in verse 22 of chapter 7, remember that. Look at that verse there. Many will say to me on that day, on judgment day, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons and perform many miracles? These are religious people who are going to church every week. And they're standing for Jesus on judgment day. And they're saying, did we not perform many miracles? And then Jesus is going to say to them plainly, I never knew you. It didn't matter that you went to church. It didn't matter that you faked miracles. It didn't matter that you tried to prophesy. It didn't matter that you said, you know me. Jesus said, I never knew you. I never knew you. Away from me, Jesus said, you evildoers. <laughs> These are people who went to church most of their life. As I mentioned earlier, the many in this verse will not primarily be atheists or rank pagans, but those who think they're saved, who think they're in the, ki in the kingdom, who think they're on their way to heaven. The many is referring to those who professed with their mouths just to know Christ. They gave verbal assent. They pretended to trust Jesus Christ, but they failed to come to Jesus on his terms. And there are many on the wide road. It's packed. It's like an LA freeway in rush hour. It's packed from side to side with many people all heading in the same direction. And the group that is destined for life, eternal life, is few in number, Jesus says, Remember what Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two fourteen. He said, many are called, but few are chosen. We need to understand this, that Christians are not few in number because the gate is too narrow and too small to accommodate more. There's no limit to the number of people who can go through the gate. If they go God's way in repentance for their sins and in trusting Jesus Christ to save them, they can get through. 
Nor is there only a few because heaven is too small. That's not true either. There's plenty of room for everyone in heaven. There are only a few because of our own or their own individual choices. We can either choose God's way or our way. God's way is enter through the narrow gate. Sadly, many people with their own selfish motives reject God or just ignore him. And they follow their own ways and they will end up on the broad road to destruction. What road are you on this morning? Which group are you in? Now is the perfect opportunity to examine your heart. In fact, Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself to see if you're a Christian. Test yourself, he said. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Have you come to Jesus on his terms, not your terms, his terms? Have you made the decision to follow Christ as he wants you to? Was it a personal decision between you and God? Were you fully repentant of your sin? Did you accept Jesus Christ and him alone with no baggage? It's not Jesus plus something else. It's not Jesus plus Buddha or Jesus plus Joseph Smith or Jesus plus Muhammad or Jesus plus my good works or Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus alone. Jesus plus or minus nothing. He is the only way. And if you've done that, that's tremendous. You're on the narrow road. (laughs) You're on your way to eternal life. If you haven't done that, then... Now is your opportunity. Today is the day of salvation, Scripture says. If you're prepared to give up everything to follow Jesus and ask him to forgive you of your sins and to set you free from your guilt and your sin, then he'll do that. And he'll allow you to enter through the narrow gate. And you will be on the road to eternal life. Chris Mueller said last Sunday in his message, And I think it's been said many times, but he said this to the Christian, this life is the only hell you will face. And to the unbeliever, this life is the only heaven you will face. So as a Christian, you can't have your best life now. (laughs) You can't. The best life is still ahead of us. In other words, eternity is going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome for the Christian. But for an unbeliever, eternity is going to be awful. It's going to be anguish. It's going to be eternal hell. This life can be tough for a Christian. We understand that, don't we? (laughs) There's persecution, there's suffering, there's heartache, there's pain. But be encouraged because the future is unbelievable. It's going to be great. It's going to be better than we can even imagine. Maybe you're here this morning and you're weary and you're hurting and maybe feeling miserable or guilty. Maybe you need to come to Jesus. Well, you can do that even today. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Rest for your guilty soul. Jesus can fix that. He can forgive that. So make sure your heart's right with the Lord today. Don't put it off till tomorrow because we don't know what tomorrow brings. Make your heart and your life right with Jesus today. That's what he would want. Just bow our heads. Father, we, we thank you for this just powerful reminder of what is some of the most important things that we need to be considering in life. Lord, you give us so many things to enjoy in this life, whether it be friends or family or activities, hobbies, whatever, travel. But Lord, help us to make the right decision when it comes to the most critical things in life and that is where we stand before you and what our relationship is with you and so father i pray this morning that you would help all of us to choose the narrow gate which takes us on the narrow way which leads us to eternal life and if there's anyone here lord that hasn't yet made that choice made that decision i pray that you would convict their hearts and their souls so that they would do it And that you would make them restless until they sort that out. May it even be today, the day of salvation for them. So Father, we commit these things to you. We leave your word to resonate in our hearts and in our minds. That you would use it to challenge us, 
to convict us and even to encourage us as well. Thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gives us hope both now in life and in death. And Lord, may we truly sing that now to bring you glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.